glad that you're here. Rainy afternoon, and we need to rain, so it's good, good to have it, and good to be inside out of it, and hopefully it'll keep on raining. Uh, if you happen to be visiting with us, I didn't notice anybody particularly, but we're glad you're here. We still have a, a lengthy group uh, that we need to be praying for. I want to continue to uh, pray for Ed's father with the cancer treatment. Uh, Kim Inslee, she's doing well. She's still in room 216 up at the uh, Life Care, but progressing with the therapy, and it's looking much better. Nancy Sharp, still dealing with that blood clot in her leg. Uh, Jamie Pendergrass, of course, still needing a heart and that type of thing. Tom Breedy. Uh, Tom has, has some broken ribs that don't want to heal, it seems like, and he's also having some numbness in, in an arm. Christine Cabal, uh, they uh, do have her under hospice now. Uh, she, she's not sleeping hard at all, and that's making it really hard on her and, and Donnie as well. Uh, Bonnie uh, Bolin, uh, Tom's mother, as we've announced, did have that surgery on her leg. Um, Paul, uh, Robert, and, and Mary Paul in Michigan, it's Katie McCord's grandparents, still not doing well. And uh, Edna Lewis, this is uh, Kathy Wooten's sister-in-law, uh, they go to, to Sell Creek to church. She had some kidney surgery, and then she's had to go back to the hospital, so I don't know what's going on with that, but... Uh, as to keep uh, Edna Lewis uh, in our prayers. Uh, again, uh, sympathy to, to Madge's family. That service, funeral service was yesterday. Appreciate uh, uh, those that, that attended that and uh, keep the family in your prayers there. Thursday night class, keep that in mind at, at 6 p.m. Uh, tomorrow. Uh, the uh, Bethel Church of Christ continues their meeting uh, next Sunday and Monday night. This is the fourth of those. Uh, Eric Lyons is the speaker. Uh, services are at 8 and Sunday night and Monday night. And there's about three other meetings, I think, starting. So you might want to look at the uh, bulletin board uh, for uh, that. Stephen is going to lead her singing. Uh, Spencer has our uh, opening prayer, and I have the uh, devotion. Our first song will be number 800, number 800, and what I'm thinking about, I'll, let's do 920 for the invitational, Eric, please, 920, the first, second, and last. Okay, number 800. If for the
Would you please bow with me? Dear Lord, thank you for this evening you've given us that we can come together and strengthen one another and, and worshiping you and learning more about your word. We pray that you open up our hearts and our minds so that we can take the lessons we learned here this evening and, and help use them in our lives outside these doors. We pray that you be with those who cannot be with us this evening, dear Lord. Um, ones we've mentioned, be over them, help restore them to a much needed state of health so that those who can can be back with us and that we know your healing hand is capable of, of doing many wonderful and powerful things. We pray that it's your will that those things will be done. We thank you for the, the rain that has come, Lord, and we pray that you continue to let it. We definitely need it to keep everything growing and from drying up. We do appreciate it, Lord. We know that you will do everything that you can to take care of us. Let us always keep our focus on that, that we know that even though we don't always understand why things go the way they do, that your, your healing hand is doing what's best for us and that we look to you and those opportunities that you give for us to help further your kingdom and do your work. Thank you for all, all the many wonderful blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a, a doctor, or a law, yeah, I was a doctor and a lawyer and a little boy uh, and a preacher. Uh, they were on a, an airplane flight, just one of those, like a Sunday afternoon in a private plane. But suddenly the plane developed engine trouble. In spite of the best efforts of the pilot, the plane started to go down. Well, finally, the, the pilot uh, grabbed the parachute and yelled to the passengers that they'd better jump. He bailed out. Unfortunately, there were only three parachutes left. But the doctor grabbed one, and he said, uh, I'm a doctor. I say life, save lives, so I need to live. Out he jumped. The lawyer then said, I'm a lawyer, and lawyers are the smartest people in the world. I deserve to live. So he grabbed a parachute and jumped out. But the preacher looked at the little boy and said, My son, I've lived a long and full life. You're young and have your whole life in front of you. Uh, you take the last parachute and jump. The little boy handed it back to him and he said, uh, uh, Everything's all right. Uh, preacher said, The smartest man in the world just took my backpack and jumped out. <laughs> I don't imagine that helped him too good, did it? You know, sometimes we, we think we're smart until we hopefully realize that we're not. Uh, not too long ago, you know, I heard that, that old adage that the more you know, the more you know you don't know. And I think that's definitely true with the Bible many times, is you keep studying it, and, and there's just more and more and more there. But I, I want us to think for just a moment about the, the truth that, that Jesus is, is the way, the truth, and the life, John 14 and verse 6. And we don't have to be that smart to know that and to understand that. Uh, we uh, are going to be judged based upon our, our willingness to, to study and to learn uh, and to gain the wisdom that God promises us so that we can uh, obey the gospel, that we can then... Uh, try to the best of our abilities uh, to live a faithful life. And that doesn't mean that God expects us to live a perfect life. And it doesn't mean that we have to understand completely everything. But there are some basic things that Jesus is the Christ that we must understand. And we may not understand that to its fullest extent. But to know that he is the Son of God to know that he came and he lived and he died for us. He is the way to heaven. He is the truth that if we put our, our faith and our confidence in him, uh, we can be assured that, that we're going in the direction uh, that we need to go. And he is life. He is eternal life. Uh, this life is short and passing, but we're going to live on one way or the other. 
And of course, all of us want to be in heaven. Uh, we want to be with Jesus. And he promises us that he'll come back. Uh, and when he does return, there'll be a judgment. And if we are living according to, to the truth, according to the knowledge that he has, has blessed us with through the scriptures, you and I uh, can be assured that we'll be where we want to be uh, throughout eternity, that which has no end. So tonight, if you're not a Christian, if you've not responded to the invitation of Jesus to repent and be baptized, or if you have, if any of us have fallen short and allowed life and the world and sin to pull us back, uh, what a wonderful opportunity we have tonight to turn our life around, to uh, recommit our life. And if that's something you need to do in a public way, or if you need to be baptized into Christ, the invitation is yours as we stand and sing. Dismiss our teachers to your classes, please. And the kids as well. If you're in the teenage class, so you're going to stay out here tonight. Uh, I don't know. Ryan wasn't able to make it, I think, and that's the circumstance there. Matthew is speaking tonight up at Carnes in their uh, summer series, so that's where he and his family are at tonight. So that means you are stuck with me. Uh, the series that Matthew's been doing is uh, uh, three things, uh, and when he brought it up, I, I asked him about uh, if I could do the three stooges, and he, he didn't seem to like that idea. I then suggested the three little pigs. Well, it was a little more favorable, but he didn't really like that either. So, I'm not going to do anything that has to do with three. <laughs> what I want to do is talk about the church. Uh, open your Bibles to Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, and verse 18, uh, we, we have a, a passage that uh, all of us are, are familiar with. Uh, we might not be able uh, to quote it exactly, but I think pretty much all of us uh, would be able to uh, uh, relate what is happening here. We find that, that Jesus is talking to his disciples and he is in the, the midst uh, of his uh, three-year uh, ministry. Uh, and that there was questions about who he was. Uh, and he asked his disciples, what, what's everybody saying? And they said, well... You know, some saying this, and some saying you're a prophet, and all that type of thing. And then uh, Jesus comes back and says, but, but what do you say? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, you know, the Son of, 
uh, of the living God. And then uh, in response to uh, that, uh, Jesus in verse 17 says uh, to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for bless and blood is not revealed this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail uh, against it. And what we're wanting to think about for a few minutes tonight is that promise to build the church. Now when you think about the, the confession that Peter made, that is the very foundation of the church. Uh, Peter was not the foundation, but what Peter said was the foundation, that Jesus was the Christ, uh, the Son of God. Uh, and with all of the mistakes that, that Peter made, uh, you know, uh, if he had known that the Bible was going to tell about all the mistakes he made, I don't know what Peter would have done. But uh, we love him because he had an answer. It wasn't always the right answer, uh, but, but he got it. And when you get to Acts chapter 2, in that first gospel sermon, it's no accident that Peter was the spokesman and that it was what he had to say that was recorded. We know that he stood up with all the apostles, so we can assume that, that all of them uh, may have very well spoken on that day, but their message would have been basically the same. But everything was founded upon the fact that, that Jesus was the Son of God uh, and that he came to this earth uh, born of the Virgin Mary, uh, lived some 30 years uh, and went to the cross for us. And the reason for that was so that he would establish the church and through the church you and I uh, could be saved. I heard, uh, I don't know, We've been to so many, uh, heard a couple sermons Saturday, heard three Sunday, one Monday, one last night. So I don't know which one of the preachers said this, <laughs> but emphasize the fact that there, there really is just one purpose for us here upon this earth, and that is to glorify God. That's the bottom line, to glorify God. And we do that in and through the church. Jesus gave us a platform. He gave us a, a, a body, the church. And he allows all of us to become members, if we will, if we'll humble ourselves and obey. The Lord himself will add us to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47. And it is in the church that we glorify God. Uh, God gets the credit. That's one of the reasons that it's not good enough just to be a good person. Uh, obviously, Christians should be good people. But if you're just a good person and you're not a Christian, who's getting the honor and the glory? Yeah, yourself. Yeah, we're just bringing it on ourselves, basically. Yeah. And uh, we need to recognize and understand that in one way, we're not very important. In another way, we are very important. And we know that because Christ died for us. And he didn't die for people that are not important. But our importance really shines through when we fulfill the desire that God has for us and fulfill the, the, the reason for which he created us, and that is to show honor and glory to God. So when you think about that and you sort of bring all of that uh, into the picture... I think, hopefully, we begin to see that, that the church uh, is very, very important. There are those that teach that the church was kind of an afterthought, that, um, you know, Jesus came to establish an earthly kingdom, and he was rejected, and as a result of that, as a substitute, he established the church. And that's not true at all. Uh, he fulfilled his purpose the kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And if you continue to read here on in verse 19 of Matthew 16, 
He talks about giving Peter and the others the keys of the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom and the church are one and the same, and they're used interchangeably. It's not an earthly kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom, uh, even as the church is a spiritual body. So uh, Jesus did exactly what he intended to do. And you and I uh, can uh, be very thankful for the fact that he did that so that we might even be here tonight to, to study the scriptures and to remind ourselves how blessed we are to be able to have our sins taken away through the blood of Christ. Anybody with a, with a thought or question about any of that or something you want to add to it? Okay, what I want to do is talk about the, the uniqueness of the church of Christ. And we'll look at, see how our time holds up. But uh, one of the last reports that I read, that there were uh, in America some 33,000 churches. Uh, I suspect that number has grown. Uh, but 33,000 different churches. Uh, most of these are what we would call denominations. There are some that would claim to be the, the church of the Bible and, and not a denomination at all. The, uh, the Catholic Church would be one of those examples. But there are others as well that are non-denominational. But, uh, you know, that, that's a lot of, of churches, a lot of different organizations. Is... The Church of Christ unique when we look at all of these different churches uh, together. Uh, and uh, I want us to, to, to realize and hopefully in a few moments conclude that it is unique, but I think it is important for us to understand why the Church of Christ is unique, why it is not just a denomination among different uh, denominations. To begin with, is the church, the church of Christ, the only church that tries to follow the Bible exactly? What would your answer be? Church of God. Church of God. And, and many of them claim to try to follow the Bible exactly, right? Yeah, uh, there, there, there are a lot of churches that claim, in fact, I would suspect that most would say that that's what we're doing. We're, you know, we're, we're following the Bible. Well, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Paul, as he spoke to this young preacher, uh, he, he told him that, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And the word inspiration means God breathed. So the Bible claims, the Scriptures claim uh, to be uh, from God. I suspect that there are a lot of people in the world, church people, religious people, that would be surprised to know that their preacher really doesn't believe 2 Timothy 3, 16. There are a lot of preachers. There are a lot of those that are not preachers that would hold that the Bible is a good book and it's good to, to live by it, but... There are things in it that uh, are simply not true, that there, there are mistakes that, that are made uh, in the Scriptures. So there are, are many that would not believe that the Scriptures are, are, are verbally uh, inspired uh, of God. For example, some would doubt the creation uh, account. Going back to Genesis chapter 1, 2, uh, and 3. One of the lessons that, that we heard this week at Bethel had to do with uh, dinosaurs uh, and the, the reality of dinosaurs and how people have used dinosaurs for many, many years to try to prove that this world is, is millions and millions and millions of, of years old. Uh, the truth is, uh, dinosaurs were real. They did live. Uh, there 
on a regular basis digging up bones and skeletons, and, and they, they were here. Um, they became extinct, uh, extinct like a lot of other things, like the saber-toothed tiger, for example. Um, I forget what other examples a preacher used the other night. But, but there, there's a lot of animals that you know, have been here, and, and now they're gone. Same thing is true uh, with dinosaurs. But those things are being used by atheists and, and others to try to prove that, you know, what the Bible says and, and the claim for this world just to be about 6,000 years old uh, is simply uh, not true. Uh, in the book of Job, chapter 40, uh, he talks about the uh, behemoth, or about, uh, has a better way to say that word, but behemoth. Ah, just had high food, right? Behemoth. Uh, you know, and you look at, at, at that, and uh, if, if that's not a dinosaur, I don't know what, what it is. But, uh, you know, the, the, they were here. The problem with that type of thinking is that it contradicts some of the things that the Bible says. If we cannot trust Genesis 1, 2, and 3, can we trust anything else? That's the dilemma, isn't it? You know, it's either verbally inspired from God, all of it, or it can't be trusted. Now, uh, Matthew had a, a lesson uh, not too long ago in, in talking about, you know, translations and that type of thing. And, and we realize that man has had a hand in that. But one of the beautiful things is to see how God has controlled that uh, and as you look at the scriptures, uh, you can see that, that they don't contradict themselves, that there's a, a theme from Genesis all the way through a book that was written over a period of 1,600 years by 40-plus writers. You, you don't have mistakes. You don't have contradictions. So the Bible proves itself to be the Word of God. So as you look back there in Genesis 1, uh, and you look at the creation, uh, you can have confidence that God created everything in six days, and he rested from those creation uh, on the seventh day. And, and those days were morning and night, so 24 hours. Uh, and there are those who have tried to argue that that was not the case. Uh, but the Bible says, that it was. We might not understand every little, little part of it. But there are a lot of preachers and a lot of churches that would hold to, to evolution and try to make it fit what the Bible says rather than just taking the Bible for what it says and understanding that um, when Adam was created, you know, how old was he when he was created? What? Full of grown? So how old, you think? Huh? <laughs> yeah. He was one second old, but he could have been a hundred, right? Yeah. He was fully grown. What about everything else? Well, what about the oak trees in the garden? How old were they? Well, there was fruit there, right? They were to eat of the fruit of the garden except for that one tree. And that one tree had something. Uh, some people like to think it was an apple. Uh, I don't know. I, I like apricots. It was an apricot tree. But it was a full-grown tree, was it not? So as you begin to, to look at, at that, and look at, at what God uh, did in the creation. Uh, we either accept it or we, or we reject it, you see. And uh, some have thought because of the earth and the things that, that were created that it had to have evolved over thousands of years. Um, that's not what God did. He created a man, an adult. He created a woman. An adult. Uh, he created trees that were already producing and all of those things. That's what the Bible teaches. But there are those that try to 
put in the, the idea uh, of evolution. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, uh, Noah uh, and the ark. There are those that deny that that uh, was a, a true story uh, as well. Some have tried to say, you know, it, um, it, it was big enough. You couldn't have had all those animals on the ark. You may have, have read uh, someone took and they, they took the different levels of the ark and the length and, and the width. And I forget right off how many train cars that would be. But when you figure up the space, there was plenty of space for all the animals. And uh, as was pointed out uh, Monday night in that lesson, uh, they didn't have to be full grown, did they? <laughs> you know, uh, why would you take a, a full grown elephant? I'd find me a little fella. Uh, you know, uh, you, you have the, these animals that were taken in, but even if they were all full grown, then there was still plenty of room uh, on that ark. Uh, but some, again, have, have tried to, to put doubt on, on what the Bible actually says about that. What about the parting of the Red Sea in Exodus 14? There are those that have tried to say that there's a part of that Red Sea, the water's not very deep, and you could, you know, wade on through. Uh, there are others that have just declared that it's just not accurate. Well, uh, it is, and it was. What about Jonah being swallowed by the fish? Again, there are those that have uh, rejected that. Either he was or he wasn't. And um, what about Jesus walking on the water and then Peter walking on the water? Uh, I've read that some have said that there were actually rocks there and they were just underneath the water and you couldn't, uh, Jesus knew where they were at and that's the way he was walking uh, on the water. Um, there's a, uh, a place on Interstate 95, uh, not far from Savannah. And if you've ever been through there, if you're going south, it's on your left, and there's a big lake, and there's uh, heavy machinery setting all over the place in that lake. I mean, there's a backhoe, there's a dozer, and it's sitting in the water. Well, if they'll drop the water just about this much, you can see the road. But just to look at it as you go down the road, uh, it looks like they're just floating along <laughs> out there in the water. It's kind of whoever came up with that, I guess, is pretty... Uh, unique, but Jesus actually walked on the water, or he did not. And the point, I guess, that I'm trying to make is that, you know, th there's no middle ground here. We either take the Bible or we don't. We either believe it to be uh, God's Word, and we accept it, and by accepting it, we then accept God, obviously, the Creator uh, of all things. And there's so, so much evidence uh, to show that the Bible is accurate. The predictive prophecy, where it was prophesied by uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah. We've been talking about Ezra and Nehemiah and uh, Cyrus and Darius, these Persian kings that were mentioned, you know, hundreds of years before, 150 years before they were ever born. Uh, so we, we see those prophecies and we see uh, the complete fulfillment uh, of the, those things. Uh, there are things about uh, the ocean, talks about the, uh, the paths uh, in the ocean, Psalms chapter 8 and verse 8. Hadn't been that many years ago uh, when uh, they discovered that indeed there are paths in the ocean. Uh, and if you're crossing the ocean, uh, they will get in those paths uh, and the current will pretty much carry you along. Uh, you know, there uh, are, are things about uh, uh, Hezekiah in 2 Kings 20, verse 20 is a good example. And it talks there about Hezekiah's tunnel. And uh, there were those that taught that, that this really never happened. But they have dug down uh, under Jerusalem as it is today. Uh, and you can actually go into a part of that tunnel that Hezekiah dug many years ago to bring water from the outside under the ground 
into the city of Jerusalem so that when they were attacked um, uh, or there was a siege of the city, that they'd have the water that they needed. Those are just a few examples uh, of the fact that what the Bible says is true. Uh, there were those that denied there was ever a band by the name of Pilate. But they have found a, a plate, uh, and uh, on this particular plate, uh, inscribed is actually Pilate's name. And they are continually discovering that type of thing, showing that the Bible uh, is exactly what it claims to be the Word of God, and that the Scriptures are uh, reliable. But here's the question again. Uh, is the Church of Christ the only one that uh, defends the Bible that way? Uh, the answer is no. There are others uh, that would try to defend it uh, and would try to defend it the same way that you and I would, showing that truly it is uh, the Word of God. Number two, is the Church of Christ unique in the fact that its members have love for one another and each other? No, yeah. I, I, some of, sadly, uh, some of the most loving people in the world are not members of the church. <laughs> you know, they, they maybe would put us to shame sometimes as to how loving and, and caring uh, that they are. You remember in John 13, Jesus said, a, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another and by this uh, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another verses 33 and 34 so one of the, the characteristics of the church of Christ is love for God love for one another uh, and we don't always get done I guess the way that we should when we think about that but you know this is one of the things that, that really sets us apart uh, in the religious world is, uh, you know, not seeking vengeance, not seeking to, um, you know, retaliate, retaliate or, you know, to, to fight back, to, to deal with, with criticism and to deal with wrong deeds against us in, in a loving and a kind way. And even though we may struggle at times with that, that is one of the characteristics that makes us unique, that, that, that sets us uh, aside. And it's one of the goals that we should always hang off, to, to have that love. And it is one of those things that should attract the world. People in the world should be able to look at us and see us as, as a loving and a kind people and as a result of that, hopefully want to be a part that they want to have. You know, what is it that keeps you and I from hitting back when we're hit? Uh, what, what is it that keeps us from seeking at vengeance? Uh, it is the love of God and, and the love for our fellow man. And that should be very attractive. And as Jesus said, you know, that, that's the badge. You know, that is one of the things that distinguishes us as the church of Christ. It is that love, that compassion, and that understanding. But are we unique in that? Not, not really. Uh, there, there are others that have that, that spirit of, of love and compassion. And sometimes in communities, uh, denominational folks will, will step up before we do. And, and, you know, when there's a, a tragedy such as a tornado, that type of thing, um, that uh, ought not to be. <laughs> we ought to be, you know, on the front line uh, of helping people and encouraging uh, people. So uh, we're, we're not unique in, in that. Anybody with a thought there? Okay, number three, is the Church of Christ the only group that believes in one body and one Faith, one body, one church, Ephesians 4. Yeah, 
It is a good question, yes. It is a good question. Uh, the, the answer is that, uh, no, we're, we're, we're not the only ones that believe uh, in one body and in one faith. If you have your Bibles open, you might look at Ephesians 4. And in verse 4, uh, he starts out by saying that, that there's one body. Uh, he goes on to say that there's one Lord, there's one faith. Uh, there, there's one baptism, and he gives all these uh, lists uh, of, of ones. And if you go back to Ephesians chapter 1, and the last couple of verses talks about uh, Christ having authority over all uh, uh, to the church, which is his body. So the Bible teaches that there is one body, there is one church, and there is one faith uh, that leads us to understand what it is that God uh, would have us to do. Uh, in John 17, Jesus talked about the fact that he and the Father were one. Uh, and that was his desire for his disciples, his followers. That the apostles and others in the first century, and that you and I today that we would be united in Christ. One faith, one gospel, one truth in one church. And uh, in Acts chapter 2, uh, you remember that some 3,000 people were, were baptized, verse 41. But in verse 42, it says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, one faith. Uh, that they continued uh, in prayers, they continued uh, in fellowship. So there was a, a oneness, there was a unity. When you go back to the first century, you know, there, there was one church, one church. Now, there were different religious groups. You had your Pharisees and your Sadducees and your Zealots and others uh, that sort of were a part of the uh, the Jewish community. But as far as the church is concerned, uh, there was one uh, and only one. Now, over the years, there were a lot of divisions, uh, and that continues to be a problem today. Today, what we see is people getting upset or mad about something and just going down the road and starting another church. And uh, all sorts of churches, all sorts of, of names. Well, we can see that that was a problem even in the first century. When you begin to read uh, Paul's uh, letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, and, uh, you know, some were uh, trying to follow Cephas or Peter and some Paul and some Apollos and some Christ, but even those that were following Christ, it seemed to be more of a, uh, uh, a party rather than true uh, allegiance. And, of course, uh, Paul uh, condemned that, rightly so, and made it very plain that they were baptized into Christ, not into Paul or Paulus or, or, or Peter. But the, uh, the desire for a church to leave off denominationalism or, or sectarianism type of, uh, of allegiance, again, we are not unique in that. Uh, there are uh, churches out there that are non-denominational. They, they make uh, that claim. Some of them have actually broken off, like from the Baptist church or the Methodist church. And uh, they claim to be uh, the church of the Bible, uh, and are not holding on to these different uh, allegiances. So what we claim is not unique in that sense uh, that we're the only ones because there's others that, that do that uh, as well. Anybody with a, anything you want to add to that? Okay, here's another one. Is the Church of Christ unique in a weekly observance of the Lord's Supper? Are we the only ones that do that each Sunday? No, no, that, that, that's not true uh, either. In fact, there was a survey done, LifeWay survey this, 1,066 Southern Baptist pastors. 
in the survey. So 1,066 Southern Baptist preachers, and they ask about, you know, what do you do about the Lord's Supper? 1% offered the Lord's Supper every week on the Lord's Day, 1%. 18% protect the Lord's Supper once a month, 15% five to ten times a year, 57% quarterly, and 8% either didn't do it at all or only three times a year. I guess Easter and Christmas and I wonder what the other one would be. Um, it could have been Thanksgiving. I don't know. Might be Halloween. I, I don't know. But, you know, it's interesting that in that survey, only 1%, but there was 1% that protect the Lord's Supper uh, every uh, Sunday. Now, uh, why do we do that? Okay, example, yeah, Acts 20, verse 7, uh, upon the first day of the week, uh, when the disciples came together to break bread, the expression break bread there has to do not just with eating a meal, but the Lord's Supper. And uh, Paul used that occasion to preach to them, continues his preaching to even to midnight. If you back up there in that chapter, you'll find that uh, Paul and his group waited for seven days in order to be able to do that. I think that's significant. Uh, that they were wanting to be there on the Lord's day. Uh, and the emphasis was put upon partaking the Lord's Supper. Well, you go back to Luke's account and Matthew's account, and um, most Sundays we'll make mention of that in one way or the other, uh, where Jesus took the cup and he took the bread and he blessed it and uh, talked about them partaking uh, of it. Uh, and this time frame had to do uh, with the first day of the week and of course uh, every week has a first day so we partake of it uh, in that way are we the only ones that do that again no the catholic church does that at least many of them do the christian church does that disciples of christ also and at least one percent of the baptist and maybe others partake of the lord's supper every sunday so we're not unique in that either. Number five, is the Church of Christ unique because it sings a cappella? We don't have a piano organ. Are we the only ones that do that? No, not, not really. Um, you know, there are uh, a number of groups, the uh, Greek Orthodox Church, uh, and there are a lot of primitive Baptist when I was in Kentucky, they had what they called a hard shell Baptist, and I don't know what all that meant. But some of those groups, uh, they, they do not uh, use instrumental music in their worship. Uh, this group is smaller than in some of these other things that we're talking about, but uh, we, we're not the only ones. Why do we just sing? Yeah. There. Yeah. Comes down to authority, doesn't it? Yes, you're exactly right. There, there's there's eight passages uh, in the New Testament that talk about singing, uh, and in each and every case, that is exactly all that it is. Matthew twenty six verse thirty. Acts 16, 25, Romans 15, 9, 1 Corinthians 14, 15, Hebrews 2, 12, James 5, 13, Ephesians 5, 19, and Colossians 3, 16, which are the ones we use mostly, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in your heart uh, to the Lord. So it's an authority issue. Um, some have said that they didn't have the instruments in the first century. Uh, if they'd had them, they would have used them. How would you answer that? <laughs> Not true. Under the law of Moses. They, David is a good example. Yeah. They had, the Jews had them. They had them when Christ was born. <laughs> uh, that was not uncommon at all. Uh, and under the old law, 
uh, they uh, did use uh, instruments. But when it comes to the new law, again, the emphasis is on uh, singing. So it wasn't that they didn't know about them. It wasn't that they maybe didn't like it. Uh, but it was an authority principle. Uh, and they were seeking to, uh, to worship uh, according to the, the New Testament pattern. And when we seek to do that, uh, then we are, are unique in that, although uh, there are others that uh, don't uh, use instrumental music either. Then number six, is the Church of Christ unique in its teaching on baptism? What about that? Are we the only ones that, that teach that baptism is for remission of sins to be saved? Some Baptist churches do that as well. Yeah, Catholics do it. Christian church does it. Disciples of Christ, the Mormons, um, all of those. Maybe not everyone, but all within those groups teach that you must be baptized in order to be saved. Of course, we teach it because that's what the Bible says, and we use uh, the examples. One of the interesting things to me, that, that baptism seems to be the, the one that we argue over, but it's the only one that is mentioned in every case of conversion in the book of Acts. Uh, it doesn't always say that you have to believe even. It doesn't always say that you have to repent. It doesn't always say that you must confess Christ. But when you look at Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 9, Acts 10, Acts 16, and you look at those conversions, every case, every case, baptism is mentioned. You think that was by accident? You think God knew that we as human beings would fuss about baptism? Yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, we, we practice baptism for the remission of sins because that's exactly what they did. So is the church of Christ unique? It is in the sense that we practice every one of these. No other church does. Not all of them. The uniqueness of the church, if we are what we should be, and if we really are the church, is the fact that we follow the Bible strictly and carefully to the very best of our abilities. And if we find ourselves going in the wrong direction, we repent of that and go back to the Bible. You know the old adage, when all else fails... See what the Bible says? Hopefully, we are not that. Hopefully, we are, are constantly looking to the Scriptures. The, the church is unique. It, it's the only church that Christ died for. It, it is unique in the uh, respect for the Scriptures. Creation. Dinosaurs. Whatever it talks about there. You know, we, we respect what the Bible says teaches, realizing that if part of it's not true, the book of Esther isn't true, then how would we know that anything else uh, it is true? It proves itself to be the Word of God. When it comes to worship, uh, our, our singing, the Lord's Supper, our giving, uh, we seek to follow what the Scriptures teach. Do we always do that perfectly? As human beings, uh, we, we can mess up really easily. So there must be a, a conviction to continue to look, continue to study, and to try to the best of our abilities to uh, you know, leave our opinions out, except when God allows us to use it, and to be able to turn to the Scripture and show our, our family and our friends why we do what we do. Uh, and in, in the, at least in these six examples that we use tonight, to, to see that we are unique in the respect for the Bible. And, and that is somewhat the bottom line. Anybody with a thought there? 
Okay, instead of three little pigs, I had six points. And hopefully uh, that will be somewhat of a, of a benefit or a blessing. Anybody have a final comment? Yeah, I have one thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and the theistic philosophy is that pretty much one of the founding thoughts, as I understand it, is rather than 24-hour days, you know, the first day was, was a few thousand years, and then day two was a few more thousand. And uh, it really became a cop-out, I, I think, just to trying to balance it out. You know, we're not in competition uh, with, with anybody. We're not in competition with, with a denominational world. Uh, we need to stand solidly, you know, on the Bible, and we don't have to make excuses for it. And if we'll keep digging, I, I think, you know, in every case, we'll find out that if the Bible is accurate in, in what it teaches and what it, what it says, and we don't, uh, you know, have to find a way to say, okay, evolution and creation go together. They don't. Uh, they, they're opposites. Anybody else? Save the bell. Thank you.